four, four, four girl parts and two boy parts, but their boy parts can't reach their girl parts, which if they had a brain, I'm sure would frustrate them immensely. <laughs> but uh, they need another worm to rub against in order to make babies. That process is called knotting, and it literally looks like they're tying themselves in a knot. And away from that, both sets of worms can get pregnant times four. So we can actually get four babies from one breeding section. Fun fact, uh, I'm sure you've read on the internet that if you break a worm in half, you get two worms. What you get is two dead worms. <laughs> that doesn't work. Uh, but breeding them does. Worms will produce a cocoon on the outside of their body. And um, I'm going to, in one second, I'm going to go grab a, a bin and I'm going to bring it out here and show you what that looks like. But the cocoon forms on the outside of their body and then they crawl out of it and lay their eggs in it as it, as it comes off. So it's on top and they crawl out of it, which seems way more civilized than the way we do. <laughs> um, the uh, cocoon is a protective environment and uh, is generally durable for up to 18 months. So uh, they won't hatch unless the uh, habitat, unless the climate conditions are, are correct. So if you put worms in your garden, you take August and you go to San Diego and you don't grow anything in your garden, the worms in your garden will die. But they will be stressed by the lack of water, they'll produce a lot of cocoons. You come back in September and water it and they'll all, they'll all hatch. So you'll routinely see a, a hatch. Okay, so I'm gonna go in this thing and grab a tray, I'll be right back. Space and food, they'll stop producing cocoons. But worms need another worm in order to rub against. So you want enough worms so that they can find each other, but not too many so they don't produce cocoons. North Carolina NCSU has a Department of Vermiculture and they've studied this for 25 years. And they tell us that in this bin, we need 640 worms. Ooh. So we literally count, because I can tell you from experience, if we put 680 in, we get fewer cocoons. If we put 480 in, we get fewer cocoons. If we put 620, we get about 650 cocoons a week. We leave them in there for four weeks. We get 2,500 cocoons um, from each of these trays. I do 20 a week. And now the, the uh, so 20 will give me 2,500 times 20. I average about two worms a piece. So I'm able to breed and sell about 100,000 worms a week. Okay, so here's what a pregnant worm looks like. He said with confidence, <laughs> knowing that he could find one. Um, there's a big white belly. You can see it's called a clitellum. When it starts to stretch out, it's a little bit harder to see. But if we look for an enlarged white belly on top of it, that's where the cocoon is forming. And with equal confidence, he said, he could show you what a cocoon looks like. That's what a cocoon looks like. Looks to me like a radish seed. So if you see these in your garden, and you didn't put um, osmocote, that, you know those, the gray, if you didn't put osmocote in there, because it kind of looks like osmocote too, um, uh, that will produce between one and four babies, and again, we average two, okay? So we leave these in here for four weeks. After four weeks, we use this machine behind it to separate the cocoons from the breeding worms. The breeding worms go back into breeding containers and the cocoons go into a grow out area where the density doesn't impact the, um, the breeding. Because if we let them hatch in here, they'd stop breeding. The breeders would stop breeding. Worms are actively able to breed. They're able at four months, they're active at five to six months. They breed well for five or six months and then they get tired, so we rotate them out. So they're in the breeding uh, containers it's in inert bedding, no food value, and we sprinkle grains on top that gets them to come up, match.com for worms, and we get babies. And you can see that they sprouted. If you want to germinate your plants, you really want worm castings. Worm castings will help your plants germinate, your seeds germinate um, much, much faster. How long does a worm, average, a red wiggler's average life between one and a half and three years. A worm is, is mostly water, and so when they die in our wedges, the other worms consume them very quickly. So barring an unusual disaster, um, we never see dead worms. They just, they, they get, but, but NCSU has studied it, one and a half to three years under perfect circumstances. 
Hey Zach, anybody got a Hey Zach question? Hey Zach. How about uh, cold climates? Like if you have a you cold. Start. Come on, play with me. I know. Start with Hey Zach. Hey Zach. Now. Can you tell me what kind of uh, worms would work best in a cold climate? Yeah, so uh, red wigglers operate between 30 degrees and 90 degrees. Okay. So it never gets cold enough for, in Arizona for us ever to worry about it. For our, for our customers that have places in Flagstaff and Prescott, the red wigglers do fine all winter if you create a habitat for them. Dig out an area in the ground, um, at least large enough for the bag of worms that you might buy from us before your first snow or hard freeze, cover it with a good six or eight or 10 inches of compost, and cover that compost with um, uh, something that was a tree, mulch okay. or leaves or, or something like that. The worms will overwinter just fine, mm -hmm. no problem at all. If you're in a predominantly cool climate, if you're Minnesota or Alaska or someplace like that, then we're gonna tell you to buy European night crawlers mm -hmm. uh, because they'll do better in cool temperatures all the time. Okay. Night crawlers, so typically when you fish, you fish with night crawlers. They're bigger, longer, fatter, easier to put on a, on a hook. Um, they just don't do well in our Arizona summers, so we don't, we don't breed them. On a per worm basis, they produce more castings. Um, but it's, as I say, it's just they're hard to, they're hard to grow. Okay? Is that? Yes. Um, is the, you talked about to about 90 degrees, is that soil temperature or, okay. Yeah, it's soil temperature. So you'll see, well, we're gonna go into our castings area next. So this area, this is optimized for breeding. And they're actually in climate controlled storage uh, shipping containers. Mm. So we keep the breeding at 68 degrees, at 66 degrees, and the grow out at 78 degrees mm. all the time. Out here though, they're outdoors all the time. In the heat of the summer, we'll kick on some misters, um, but I find that unnecessary in my garden. As long as it's shaded, um, the, the, the critical mass of the soil keeps Arizona soils in the 60s and 70s. Um, you might struggle a little bit in August. We have some tips on how to how to take care of them. But uh, we've been out here. This is this. Will, we're going into our fifth summer. We've never had to replace worms. They're here summer and winter, no problem at all. Hey Zach, what's the coating on that to make it a temperature control? So it's, uh, what you're looking at is roofing insulation. So it's foam. Uh, if you had a flat roof, yeah. this is the foam. They put on a layer of foam gotcha. and then they put a um, elastometric coating, elastometric coating yeah. on the outside. Um, these guys have been going strong five years. This particular box is seven years because I started it someplace else before I opened the farm. Um, and it's fine and it's it works really, really well. It's, uh, uh, so this is a terrible place to be in August. And so I find a lot of workers do a lot of work in the worm. <laughs> In if you can't find them, look That's there. That's where right? they are. Yeah, I know where they are. Okay? Hey, Zach. Yeah. <laughs> what attracted you to worms? Okay, so uh, it's a different story. Um, that, so uh, I semi-retired from a, a consulting business. Um, so I, I was able to do whatever I wanted to do. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from Marie Curie, who says that, um, you should learn more so you fear less. Mm. Climate change scares me. Mm. And so I went back to ASU to get a second master's in sustainability. And what I learned, I learned two things. I learned that the more you learn, the more frightened you become. <laughs> no, no. It doesn't work. It might work with radioactivity. It doesn't work with climate change. Oh, no, change. how funny. Um, and I was sitting in a, I was sitting in a class, um, an, an emeritus professor, our age is talking to these 18, 19, 20 year old kids. And he said, he didn't say it this elegantly, but he said, we've got this giant, we just, we had this giant pile of dump. We dumped on you. You go figure out how to fix it. Yeah. And I thought that's crap, like, come on, we did it. Let's go fix it. Mm -hmm. And so I decided then to create an enterprise to create a fully sustainable farm where we lived, but we didn't, we didn't borrow from future generations. We just uh, we, we just used what we were able to use. And, and the more I learned, the more I found everything you see out here, you can buy on the internet point and click. We didn't invent anything. We have now invented a fertilizer. That's a different story. But we didn't invent any, none of these processes. We didn't invent any of these processes. 
So that's a long way of saying I want a sustainable farm. The first animal I started with was chickens. We could grow alfalfa to feed the chickens, but they needed a protein source. The worms were the ideal, I thought, ideal way to help the soils get better without using any chemicals, get rid of some garbage, and provide a protein source for the chickens. Um, I'm gonna show you later, we, we couldn't breed worms fast enough to be the protein source for the chickens, so we took a different direction. But everything here is, is designed for me to do what I can. This is what I can. Because I, I, it just seems to me that if we all just did what we could, we could fix these problems. And the truth is we can't. The truth is uh, what you're gonna see out here, I, I'm gonna show you a house that we built out of straw, fully mm -hmm. sustainable mm -hmm. from within a one mile radius of this farm. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna show you how it's completely off the grid. It doesn't, it, it, it creates more energy than it uses. Mm -hmm. We compost everything, zero waste. You can live in that house, you can eat off this farm and um, not have any negative, only positive impact on the surrounding environment. So I want us to do that. I want to show you what I can do. Awesome. I want to show you what you can do. Um, that, so that's the origin story. Awesome, thank okay. you. I'm going to put this away. We're going to walk over, right over to where that's careful here. This is going to turn. So we harvest the back side of that, the back side of those wedges. Um, there's 75% moisture level in the wedges. We break up all the crumbles and we leave it overnight, and that brings the moisture level down to 50%. That lets us screen it. You want to keep it moist. <clears throat> you want to keep it moist, um, but it's got to be dry enough to screen. Somebody feeds it in here, comes down there and pops out there. Come on around the corner and I'll show you what it looks like. a seminar on worms and one of the participants asked how can you make sure you're selling your customers pure worm casting and I said well the only way you can do it is to put a diaper on every worm and then change it once a day since that's not practical we screen it um, so uh, here's the one and only commercial if you're going to buy worm castings you want to buy fresh castings so the castings that you have here that we're selling today were literally in the wedges yesterday. They got they got screened this morning. So we take as, as short of time as possible because what you're trying to get is those microbes. Um, when you plant, we're gonna encourage you to plant organically in a no-till garden, which we'll talk about on the way back, but we're gonna use 95% cat uh, compost, which is relatively cheap, and 5% casting. And those castings contain the microbes, which will break down that organic material and feed your plants at the time that they do. So if they dry out, they're no good? If they dry out, they're no good. If you go into um, a, so when you buy, in a big box store, you buy those sealed containers. Um, that, and you, it comes out kind of dry, like coffee grounds or sand or something like that. It still has the nutritional value, which is not very much. You know, the NPK, this is like a 211 or a 210. There's just not a lot of, you don't use this for the, the nutrient value. You use this for the microbial value. Um, once you, they're, they're living, breathing organisms. Once they dry out and the air goes away, um, it, 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 it defeats the purpose of adding worm castings. The, the main purpose of worm castings is to add uh, microbial uh, information. So when you buy worm castings from the urban garden, you're getting castings that were harvested. So if you're going to do it, you might as well get So then the shelf pine, they must keep it cool or something? Um, we garden? sell them very, very quickly. We oh. don't store them. Oh, okay. We buy only as much as we anticipate selling Within during the... that period of time, and then we sell them off. We deliver, when they're busy during fruit tree season, yeah. we deliver to them two, three times a week. Um, so, so it's like about 72 hours? Uh, no. Well, so, again, two answers. Carefully, yeah. carefully. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do nothing else, we would like you to use this within a week. Okay. If you do nothing else. Right. If you want to keep it for a longer period of time, if you keep it cool and damp, if you keep the conditions like our wedges, yeah. the microbes will continue to live. Gotcha. And they'll live in perpetuity. I will tell you, most people struggle getting that done. Yes. Yes. 
So most people have tough times. Most people struggle with um, getting, keeping their castings really active over a long period of time. I will tell you, I encourage you, if you're going to come down here and buy castings, buy a little less than you actually need, but come back. Don't buy the big box thinking, well, I'll use two, two gallons now, and I'll use two gallons in three months, and two gallons. I'd rather you come back. You'll be happier if you come back each time to get fresh castings. <laughs> I'm going to show you. I'm gonna, we're going to go now. Buy the big box and say, one of my beds is getting real lucky. Yeah, yeah, but use it. I mean, you absolutely you're better off just using it, uh, and, and it'll do well. Are there cocoons in this? Yeah, yeah. So if you buy our castings, we don't screen out the cocoons. If you buy our castings, there's a high likelihood that you will get worms in your bed. And we hear that from people all the time. Mm -hmm. They buy our castings, they bring them home, worms two weeks later. Where do you get your initial input for your giant rows that you're Yeah, so let's out? go out there and we'll talk about it. Okay, so um, I want to take you, I, we're, I'm going to answer the question about compost in a second. We're going to get there. But I want to take you into our, uh, into our uh, ground heated greenhouse. But this is our new fly house. We're expanding our black soldier fly larva program. I'm going to show you the larva. It's on, it's, hang on, it's on its way. But I want to go in this, this the one, we're, we're wiring this. And so there's, a, there's an open ditch. Careful when you're coming across here. Uh, big steps when you get close. I just don't want anybody to get hurt. Okay. So just <laughs> take a look at it. If there's a bee inside, don't eat it. Don't eat it. What would it be in if this is both you and me? So I wanted a way to heat this greenhouse all winter long so that I could grow tomatoes and cucumbers and bananas without fossil fuel. There's these two black tall pipes. They draw air in from the top of the greenhouse. Right now, the air at the top of the greenhouse is 98.1 degrees. So six feet underground, through a lattice work of pipes that are perforated to another large black tube like this and it comes out over here. And if you were to carefully, before you leave, make your way over to here, you would see that the air coming out of here is closer to 70, 75 degrees. I'm capturing 20 to 30 degrees of heat in the soil underneath this greenhouse and it releases that heat overnight. So I'm able to use two solar powered fans to drive the heat into the ground. Captured by the ground, it releases overnight and I grow tomatoes and cucumbers here all winter long with zero cost. Now, it's a little more expensive to put in day one, but we did the groundwork ourselves and put these in. Since then, I have no cost to heat this um, operation. Um, you're seeing my three favorite tomatoes in here. Um, that orange one is uh, it's sun gold, and for those of you that are tight challenged, if you like to pick one of those orange tomatoes, I find them to be really, really sweet and not have a very rich tomato taste. These red ones are Sweetie 100s. The redder, the better. Uh, and I'm growing these uh, uh, orange uh, mid-size for slicers. Because my heirlooms, I have trouble with keeping them from cracking. And so I grow this size and then I get them really, really well. And you have bananas back here? We do. And that banana, that tree right there, uh, this greenhouse gets too hot to grow bananas in the summertime. So 
the only thing we grow in here in the summertime is uh, basil and malabar spinach. Nothing else will grow in here. That plant was planted uh, October 1st. This October? I mean, just recently October? From a pup this size. Wow. So you can see they like the conditions in here. All right, let's keep going out. We're going to take this with us. It's alive. I'm sure you don't want to cut this. Oh, gosh, it looks like the earth is moving. Okay, so these are the larvae of an oversized fly. Oh, wow. Want to hold it? Just give me two hands. They don't have teeth, they won't bite. Oh, okay. <laughs> don't drop that. You're going you're gonna to feed these to our chickens in a minute. Oh, my gosh. So higher protein than red wigglers. Right, so what this is... Um, <laughs> Uh, this is the larva of a black soldier fly. Black soldier fly is a oversized large fly. It's tropical, so it, it comes from the, we get ours from the Philippines. The, um, again, high school science, we remember that they lay eggs. The eggs become larva. The larva pupate and becomes a live fly. The live fly does not have a mouth. So male and a female, they mate. Female lays between five and 700 eggs and then they both die. The exoskeleton of that fly is mostly chitin, and we put chitin into our compost and our mixes. It tells our plants that there are bugs present when there aren't any bugs present. Why is that good? They develop their defenses from the inside out. It's just like if you drive up a street and you see one house that has bars on it, on the windows and an alarm. It won't keep a professional burglar out, but if they're walk, walking up the street, they don't choose that house, they choose a different house. Bugs do the same thing. Bugs started with chitin, uh, I'm sorry, plants started with chitin will have a less hospitable environment for bugs. We get fewer pests, okay? These guys will eat absolutely anything, meat, cheese, uh, junk food, french fries. The more you like it, the more they like it. And they'll eat 50 times their body weight in, uh, in garbage. They go from microscopic, so small you can't see them when they're hatched from the egg, to this size, in 14 days. Wow. Can you feed them poop? Yeah. Can you yeah. feed them and bacon fact, grease? You can. Now, uh, just a, 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 a aside, we, we sell this stuff here. If you have chickens at home and you want to buy larva, you can buy it in the stores. They're, they're mostly labeled under grubbies, but you just want to make sure you're buying American grown grubbies and not Chinese because they're feeding them cow manure. It's just pump full of all kinds of stuff you don't want in your hands. Um, ours, so ours get natural diets. Um, so let's do the math. Um, I, I wouldn't ask anybody else except you. How, how much, about how much do you weigh? Ballpark. Uh, you don't have to tell me. 100 pounds? More? 90 pounds. Okay, let's use 90 pounds. Let's use 80 pounds. Because you look like, you, you. to me, you look 75. But, so let's say 90 pounds. So uh, 50 times 90 is 4,500 pounds of food in, in, uh, 12, in 12 days. 4,500. Now, so let's use 5,000 because the math is easy. That's 20,000 quarter pounders you'd have to eat in two weeks. So that's like uh, 1,500 quarter pounders a day. You think you could do it? No. These guys can't. And they practically don't poop. So when we look at the bottom of this, when we're looking for poop, we're not finding any because they just, they use all of that energy to grow. So they take waste. You can see it, there's some black dots. The black dot is their poop. But uh, it, this, this will turn out to be two and a half pounds of protein. Uh, it'll have less than a quarter of a pound of poop. Why are these good? They take, uh, they have antimicrobial digestive systems. You can feed them pathogens. Mm -hmm. Pathogens get uh, cleaned up by their digestive processes. They'll take any kind of food waste, turn it into 40% protein, 10% fat, which is the ideal feed for our chickens. And we're going to take food. So uh, our problem here at the farm is telling people no. So we get food waste from, so the, the wedges behind you, which we'll talk about in a second, we get food waste from salad producers to make those. We get four 40-yard uh, containers a week food waste, 160 yard containers goes in, goes into this. We get the food waste from the Phoenix Suns Arena. It's four, Whoa. it's four to eight tons 
a week. And that's just the back of the house. Because the front of the house, all you fans don't do a good job of separating compostable from non-compostable. We can't take it and we can't sort it. So we get it from the back of the house. And so the hot isn't a problem, but the dry is a problem. If they escape, um, this is not them. This is just a house fly that's attracted by the garbage. If they escape, they just die. Okay, so that's why if you get an infestation of, of uh, black soldier fly larvae in your compost, you just let it go for a week or two, they'll pupate, they'll become flies, and then they die. It doesn't do any harm. Just, ex just extra feed. Metals. Worms will ingest heavy metals, but um, uh, then you can get rid of the worms. So it, 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 worms are used good. for heavy metal cleanup. Put the worms in. They consume the soil and consume the heavy metals, but then you have to take the worms out and, and put them to. someplace else. They're not, they're, they're not wonderful cleaners up of hazardous right. waste. Hey Zach, yeah. how would they do with like excess minerals and stuff like that? Uh, they don't, they don't, so the, the black put wood in there, they won't eat it. Got it, got it. Okay. So we screen them at, and then the, what comes out of the screen goes into the ledger. So um, I was going to show off how hot this was, but this just got turned like an hour ago, and so it's not hot right now. Um, uh, but this is just layers. You can see, so there's a big pile. The, the middle pile is ground landscape waste. We get, we get that from landscapers who agree to grind it completely. The pile next to it is horse manure from stables that we know. And then we get uh, every single day 40 yard container of food waste from a company called Kalick Farms that makes bagged salads and lettuces for your grocery store. So anything that didn't go in that grocery store bag, we got out here. Um, and I'll make fun of you even though my wife does it, but you know they'll take a perfectly good orange and peel away all the stuff that protects it and then they have to put it in a plastic bag to protect it mm -hmm. so that you don't have to peel the... Yeah. And that one doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but yeah. but anyway, we get so the stuff, yeah, the stuff, yeah, so we get the stuff catering to the lazy. Okay. Exactly. The good news for us is mm -hmm. I get it, um, and I want it. Okay, let's feed some chickens, and then we'll talk. Some Bales, white wheat straw bales. There, uh, there's a few of them here on the side, so when you're walking out, if you want to see what those bales look like, um, it's the waste product from growing wheat, plus dirt and hay from this farm. So the core infrastructure of the house um, was built with material from within one mile of the farm. It's fully sustainable and predominantly waste products. The wood is beetle kill lumber. The glass is my ego on display. Um, it's the only thing that came from someplace else and it's because I wanted to be able to sit in there and look out here. Um, 12 people put the house together in three days. What? Now we added the, seal, the, 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 the um, roof, the tin came later, the solar system came later. There's a nine panel solar system and a passive water, solar water heater. This is completely off the grid. 
except that we have wireless internet and TV. Because you can't live, you just you can't live without, without the internet. Um, it has four uh, sealed flooded acid batteries, which is sufficient to allow me to heat and cool this all year round. We fill the batteries generally by 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning. And so if I had some innovative way of using that extra electricity, I would, I would do that. Um, I haven't really got a good answer yet, but uh, uh, with the mud on the inside and the outside provides an equivalent of R39 insulation, wow. which means with nothing on, this house is warm enough in the winter from just your body heat to be comfortable inside. I don't run the heat when I stay here overnight. Cook something and, I, and I'm there even when it's 30 degrees outside, it'll be 65 degrees inside. In the summertime, there's a again a high sear mini split, but because of the um, because of where it's situated, because the only window faces north and is shaded completely, because it's so well insulated, because we have the trees and the mulch, uh, the daytime temperature in the house stays around 80 degrees with nothing on. Perfect for me. Wow. I can cool it beyond that. I can make it any temperature that I want for free. So once I built this house, there's zero expense. I've left these sides exposed so you can see what they look like, but through all of our rainstorms, that's what these look like. These are just shy of a year uh, old, and you can see that in three or four years, I'll have to come back out here with some mud and hay uh, in, order to, um, in order to keep the walls the way I, I want them to be. But um, lucky for me, uh, though the mud is affordable. But yeah. the other thing is, um, that will stick to itself. It will, absolutely. Okay. How much besides the free labor did this cost? So, um, uh, let's just talk about the components, okay? The hay to build it was $600. The wood frame was about $2,500 more. The, um, the, the, the ceiling panels were another about $2,000. So for less than $5,000, I built the core infrastructure. Mm -hmm. The window, as I say, is that's an ego thing. If I were building this to do it economically, I would have just put in a standard Home Depot door and maybe another window. Um, so I spent a couple of thousand dollars on that window. The solar system was $4,300. It's gone up since then. And I replaced the batteries because I had, I had batteries where you had to add water. And, and the process was just, it was kludgy and it took a lot of, it just was harder and so I replaced the batteries. So what you're looking at as is all in, $11,200. Wow. Now, and you say, wow, but I, the, the cool thing about this is aside from being essentially completely sustainable, the, the two parts of this that are not sustainable, the cement pad I put in, when I, before I put in the, the food forest, I put in the cement pad because I was planning to do this. Concrete is a terrible product. If I were really trying to do this sustainably, I would do a wood. I do a wood deck. And then the solar panels came from China because that they're, that's where they make them and they use heavy metals in them. And so, so those two things are not sustainable, um, but it's a trade-off in that there's no fossil fuel. Um, I have interns who are moving into this neighborhood and they're paying between two and $4,000 a month for apartments. Yeah. So if you think about it, four, three, four months of apartment expense and you own this house and you never have to pay another penny. Mm -hmm. The water comes from a well, the solar comes from a, from the, I mean, the power comes from the solar. There's no utilities, so it's essentially zero cost of living. Awesome. I'm pretty excited about this. If, if the city mm -hmm. would give us permission, we'd put more of them on there, but they won't. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different... huge housing crisis for homeless. Yeah, right. we had the mayor out here and we showed we showed the mayor. So the mayor and some of her housing people came out here and, and um, uh, uh, Councilman Garcia, who just got voted out, came out here and we talked to him about doing this. We said, just give us an acre. This is actually less, this is three quarters of an acre. We can put 50 houses on here. So just give us an acre. We'll put up the infrastructure trees, the canopy trees. And I'll find 50 companies that'll send us 12 people for a weekend to build one of these houses and they'll pay for it. I, I, I have no question in my mind that I could get Salt River Project or Chase or Schwab or, or yeah. you know, any number of companies to come out here and take it on as a project and build it in a weekend because it's just that easy. And they said, well, it doesn't qualify. It doesn't, you know, we're worried about the walls and we're worried about the permanence and et 
center, center, center. So uh, we're still working on it. But. We could use more of a demo there. Okay. I appreciate the good fight. So this is, um, <laughs> this is on our site map for city zoning. This is my granddaughter's playhouse. Okay. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a bathroom. The, Did you the, say the square, square footage? Uh, it's 140 times two, particularly in the spring and fall. If you come out tonight, you can have a barbecue out here. You don't have to go inside. Get a nice picnic table over there. And then when I'm ready, I go upstairs and, and go to bed. It's got a full queen size bed upstairs. And I can keep it any temperature that I want. Is that what, like second level movement up there? Is that plywood along that? Yeah. Is that just so you can mount things? Yeah. And no toilet? Yeah, so the toilet's in that green building over there. It's a composting toilet. Um, when I initially, so I laid this out before I had anything on the, I knew I wanted to do this and I laid it out before I had anything on the property. Um, and I thought to myself, not knowing, that I wanted the bathroom to be as far away as possible. Turns out it doesn't smell. And it's a long way at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> and so if I were gonna do it again, I would put it right there because, because handled properly, it doesn't smell at all. It doesn't create any problems. It doesn't bring in any additional bugs. Um, it's a really, really good system. Again, if I were doing this for the city, I'd just connect to the sewer system. Mm -hmm. So we'd be sewer connected and, and uh, that wouldn't be an issue permits. at all. Well, you need permits for all this stuff. And, and the permitting process, because it doesn't check the right box, is a little bit more arduous. All right, let's move on. expert at this than I am but you'll see there's a whole series of swales um, these are created in guilds the guilds are designed to have compatible plants living together uh, for uh, canopy trees to protect smaller trees uh, stuff growing at all levels this is year three of my asparagus and um, I'm not a fan of uncooked asparagus except for these yeah uh, fresh Asparagus right out of the ground is spectacular. Sorry for teasing you. I don't have another. Yes. <laughs> but it's just absolutely delicious. Um, we can talk about the, the trees and the various functions of the trees. This is a Pakistani mulberry. You can see it's in full fruit. We have a whole hedge of dwarf black mulberries that are just absolutely delicious. And, and if you were to come back here in two or three weeks and you're invited to do that, this tree is, they'll all be purple and um, just absolutely delicious. In three weeks? Three weeks, mid, mid to late April. The dwarfs, this tree over here is a dwarf and uh, we'll walk past it. You'll see that it's got a little bit of frost damage. It got cold down here yeah. at the wrong time, um, but it looks like they're gonna, like there'll be enough to grow out it. You can see they're just starting to turn and they'll turn black. My grandkids come out here and they eat until their hands and their face are completely black. And it yeah, lasts yeah. a good yeah. week. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So um, let's yeah. just wander this way. We hired people. I didn't. I wasn't an expert in this, but we hired Kristen, people. right? Yeah, Kristen. Came so out. Kristen Parsons, um, yeah. whom we all know, yeah. Yeah, so she gilded just, this place. Wow. Right. So she designed. So we. It was very deliberate. In, in the canopy trees and the things that were happening at the layer and the way the swales run and the way the water moves its way through this so that things that need more water get more water and things that don't need as much are isolated from the from that water. Um, what, so this was a cotton field when I bought it uh, five years ago. Then you put a genetically modified cotton starch that's the only thing that'll live in that dirt. Um, and then of course you killed all the organic material so you got to fertilize it and you got because they only use 25 or 30 percent of the fertilizer you got to put four times as much fertilizer as the plants need and that all runs down yada 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 when we came out here for the first six months we couldn't get weeds to grow nothing but we put down uh, 12 to 14 inches of mulch and you can see we remulched a lot of areas but you can see in these bare areas where we we didn't need to where that mulch has, has been you know over that four or five years it's turned into that leaf carbon into the soil that helps all these plants grow. The majority of these plants will have a date on them as to when they were put in the ground. You Spring 21. See, yeah, you can see over here, we actually have a guava. Um, we've had star fruit. These are passion fruit vines and we've had passion fruit. Um, the most prolific of our trees are the Arizona type. They're mulberries and stone fruit and apricots. We're gonna wander through that 
Um, I had to put this up initially because I was too impatient to wait for the for nature to do it. Um, if you look over here, so um, there's there's three banana trees that are actually in fruit, and you can see the flower on this one is just emerging, and out of that will come the bananas. So straight ahead, it's hard to see, but you're welcome to walk over there. This middle one, you can see the bananas, they're small, but you can see them emerging. That'll form a full rack in the next week or so, and then it'll take uh, between two and three months for that to mature. Mm -hmm. But when it matures, we'll have a couple of dozen yeah. bananas, which is just a, a, a very fun day. Is this a moringa? It is, a, uh, yes. So this is a moringa, and this is a moringa. And uh, again, these were nothing, there was not a single thing planted here prior to uh, 2020. So all these, that's, that's the growth in just those couple of years. And again, the moringa, so uh, fun fact, uh, they grow these giant seed pods. The seed pods fall down uh, and every spring you get hundreds of them under here. Yeah, so if I didn't come out and call them, yeah. we would have a moringa forest. Yeah. That's what the seed pod looks like. There's every some single hand. one of those trees, yeah, they'll all germinate. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's wander. I'd actually like. To... This looks like it's going to be like it's going to be pretty good. The challenge with the apricots. So if you if you notice the um, if you notice the mulberries, there's a ton of leaves, and those leaves protect the fruit. And so I get it. Here I have to fight the birds for it because you can see there's just not enough foliage. Um, on the apricots to protect it, so I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna come out here Monday or Tuesday and net this, yep. because mm -hmm. the day before it's ripe, the birds get it. Uh, I don't yep. know how they know, yeah, but, know but they, they know. Either, but but they the do. day before it's ripe, <laughs> uh, they get it. Um, this is a plum tree that actually it looks beautiful, but it's never produced any fruit. So it's got some leaves and or some flowers and some starts. I'm optimistic that this might be the year. Generally, year three to five of fruit trees is when you start to see how many, uh, real. How many chill hours does it need? Uh, it's methylates. 300, yeah, the which I might. Be fine here. Yeah. Which, Were they self-pollinating? Self uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So again, we put, we, we were, Kristen helped us be careful about what we put in. Sure. So we think we have trees that'll produce the right stuff, but you know, you never know. It's you never know. Either, right? We're gonna have this. But I've, I, I, even in yards where there's not where there's not berms, we see it. It just rises up and then it goes down and it stays more or less where it's supposed to be. It'll, it'll it'll move the, away. So you get some thistles starting. Yeah, and we come out here much, much more than I, than I ever way. thought possible to, to get rid of some of this stuff. I had in my in my fantasy world, <laughs> I put a lot of effort into this in year one, and then I just let it go. And in, and in the real world. That's just not the case. <laughs> um, so uh, you can see pomegranates, and there's some nice red flowers on the pomegranate. You can see the big. Give you a heads up on the time. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> in the in the far garden. Um, so uh, there's some sections here of onions and garlic, stuff that you put in the ground and you leave it in the ground for a long period of time. Um, these are artichokes that are now fruiting and looking good. You see a lot of interplanted um, flowers designed with a purpose in mind. So um, this plant right here with the kind of spindly sticks is milkweed. Milkweed will attract white flies. And that lets us get the white flies to a plant that can handle it and away from a plant that doesn't. And mm. that lets me grow cabbage, which is what these purple things are, unmolested. Mm. It, honestly, it's composting castings. Your, when, you do, when you grow a, a no-till garden well, your first crop is very good, but your first crop is your worst crop. And soil will just keep getting better and better and better. Every time we plant, we add an inch or two of compost and a dusting of worm casting. We do that before every planting. The plants consume it. Those nutrients go into their root systems. The root systems help break up the soil underneath it and feed the microbes and continue the process. 
So um, this, I, I, I never in my backyard got Swiss chard to look like that. Mm. And what I find here is, if I leave it alone, now you can see there's a couple that are bolting. Um, but if I leave it alone, it just does fine. Yeah, so yeah. For, I was going to ask for the irrigation. Is, do you use solar power for that? Or, because that could be excess solar, right, to run the drip? Yeah, so we, the, 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 the pressure from our, we have one distribution tank. So we have, okay. a, we have a, a rainwater collection pond up front. Mm. Um, we use solar panels and solar pumps to move it to these containers that are over here. Okay. And then from here, we use electricity. What's the structure going to do? Then you pumps can do this below. Pump, a pump? The pump, the solar pump that moves it from there to there is perfect. It's six gallons per minute. It's just slow and steady and runs all the time. Bursts of energy are really hard for solar. Okay. They're hard on batteries. Okay. Interesting. Um, solar power. No one's. We don't have one yet. Uh, the pump we running have a, from. We don't have a good. So we put in the drip. But then I could flood the irrigation. This, I could do that with solar. But I um, put in drip because it's so much more water efficient. So mm -hmm. I'm going to have to figure out a way to push the drip through. So I'm giving myself six more years and I'm hoping somebody comes up with an electric. I used to think, I, I, I expected by now that we would have replaced all of our trucks with electric trucks. And the industry has let me down. So I'm not taking that personally. But someday, all of the vehicles that run around here will either be powered by diesel that we cook ourselves using oil that we, that we sunflowers and stuff that we grow here, or they'll be electric. Mm. So my aspiration is that they're all electric and that that comes from solar power. So, but the, it, I'm waiting, the industry needs to, you can get, a, you can get an electric tra tractor right now, but the power is low and the cost is about 10 times what a normal one is. We just can't afford to be that leading edge for it. The joint S panel array on top of yeah. the tractor. Mm -hmm. to just, yeah, and then you just go. So it just go. It's self-contained. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and shade you while you're moving. water that they need from the food waste that we give them. In fact, we have to drain the water. We get extra water that we use for the composting. Wow. That's the equivalent of essentially three cows worth of protein. So I can grow three cows worth of protein in one week with no water in 40 feet by eight feet by eight feet. So I'm convinced that all of that, uh, the amount of meat and fish protein that we feed to our cats and dogs and, and poultry is a gigantic number. Um, it's in the millions of metric tons a year. We can replace that with insect protein from our own resources. So all of the resource that went into that um, cheeseburger that you didn't finish because you weren't hungry enough, um, that, that, that what's left of it, you're not keeping it, you're not eating right. it yourself. My, my number one, obviously, stop wasting food. Right. But number two is get all of that resource, let's recapture that resource in, in the black soldier fly larva so we, we reuse it to be Reproof efficient and effective. Yeah, exactly. I'm convinced that if you take home a worm bin, if you do one of our outdoor worm growing habitats, and you start to put all of your food waste into that, into your own garden, not only will you have better stuff growing, but you'll start to think about what you're buying. Because if you have too much, if you have more than you can feed your worms, then you're probably buying more than you need to have. And if you have to throw something away, there is no away. There's no, like, where, where is a way? There's no, it's not, there's no, you just can't do it. And so, um, so stop buying it. Stop buying stuff that you don't have a place for. So that, that's our aspiration. We're gonna go Make sure that it has the right CN ratios. Okay. But we don't test our soil here because, um, all of those nutrients have to be in balance. And if your soil test told you, for example, you don't have enough boron, then they send you to the grocery store to buy boron laundry detergent and you spread it out there and too much boron locks up the nitrogen. And so the problem that you solved created two more. Okay. Microbes have a conversation with plants on an ongoing basis. Plants produce uh, sugars called exudates. They grow the microbes that feed them the things that they need to have. If they're short of potassium, they will produce the exudates that will grow the microbes that will produce potassium 
for the plants. If you just get out of the way, yeah. they'll they'll grow fine. And um, I mean, you've all this is just showing off, but you've all had radishes that you know got too big. Um, they'll stuff will just grow. Beet. Stuff will just grow. And 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 I there's so I don't know if you noticed, but in the other uh, garden there were maybe six or eight feet of strawberries because one of my grandsons loves strawberries and he's convinced our growers to, <laughs> to try it. I've given up on strawberries. You, you just I can't you can't make it work right. I'm tired of fighting it, and so I've just given up on on that. I would say the same thing about avocados. You can grow avocados in Arizona if you're willing to work at it really, really, really hard. We don't work that hard on anything else. It either works or it doesn't. Yeah. Uh -huh. Two things I want to point out because I'm out of time. Uh, we're growing heritage <coughs> wheat. We had a, a Native American group come out here and say we grow wheat with no water. What? Dry, Ooh. dry water, dry farming. Dry farming. They just wait wow. for it to rain. And so they have special oh. brands, special varieties of wheat that does better in those kinds of conditions. Uh, one of the guys was out here and he was yelling at me because I'm watering that too much. It's not supposed to be that tall. Um, it's supposed to be much it's supposed to be smaller, but um, you know, oh well. You don't Sorry, you don't play well with others. I don't play well with others. Is that the Sonoran White? So, yeah, and it's. Um, they tell me that's enough grain for six loaves of bread. So uh, it's that, a lot of work. That for, yeah, they, that's a lot of work for six loaves of bread. That's why you end up with straw way. bales everywhere. <laughs> Safeway is easier. Yeah. Okay, let's head out. sell these this is uh, we have the fancy ones and the cheap ones but this just has mesh running all the way down to the bottom and we put worms in here and the worms will hang out in here and we feed them in here and we put our food waste inch of green and an inch of brown every week if I get lucky I might find some they'll be out and about and so they'll move from here out into the into the other area I've never fertilized this bed no fertilizer, never fertilize this bed. Composting castings in here, the worms take it out to the plants, and the plants do really well. And the, so, worm, the worm class that is we given have, is fun for kids, because my husband and daughter take it. So if you have a kid that likes to play with dirt, you should bring it. <laughs> or or, or, or an older yeah. kid. <laughs> okay, so that's what we got. Come back and visit us anytime. We appreciate you guys coming by. Uh, it was fun showing you around. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.